Okay, so this, was <coughs> this will be my last lecture, um, sadly enough. And um, so today the topic is will be around this McQuillan proof of Green Griffith's conjecture for surfaces with positive second segment number. So <coughs> I, I don't know how much of really of the proof I will be able to to tell you, but at least ideas I hope. But before going into that, I would like to spend 10 more minutes on topic of yesterday. <coughs> and I would like to, to present two, two, two very brief things that can be useful and to understand a little bit better. So first of all, I would like to explain you uh, how you can interpret this holomorphic sectional curvature uh, in terms of one jets which is not very well known by people. I and second, I would like to make a very short computation in coordinates on, jet, on the jet tower to, to put a little bit hands on, on jet's tower to, to understand a little bit better what's going on. Okay, I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but nevertheless, I'm doing that. Okay, so, <coughs> so the first observation is the following. So, So you you start from your manifold X. So your V now is the whole tangent bundle, okay? And suppose you have a a remission or Keller metric. On X. Okay, now <clears throat> now you can do your business of this projectivized tower. And, uh, and so at the, the first stage here, on the first floor, you have x1, which is now the projectivized bundle of line of Tx. Okay? And you have this v1. Okay, so I recall you that v1 is a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle of T x one, which is the which have uh, which has the same rank uh, as the dimension of x, so, you, and uh, how do you select the direction inside here? So the direction uh, you have n minus one direction, which are the vertical direction. Okay, so if you restrict v one to a fiber, which is a projective space, so this is the tangent space uh, to this projective space, and you have one more horizontal direction, okay? And your horizontal direction of v, v1 uh, uh, is exactly uh, the one which corresponds to the point of the projectivized of the tangent space where you are sitting, okay? Okay, so, <clears throat> so on x1, you have, so call it pi, Yesterday I called it pi 1, but now we have just one floor, so let me call it pi. You have this pi star of Tx. And inside here, you have this Ox1 of minus 1. Okay, that's the tautological bundle, line bundle. So once again, the restriction of this guy to a fiber is nothing more than O of minus 1 on the projective space. OK? But now, so you have a Keller metric on Tx. So it's, you can see it as a metric on a vector bundle. OK? This is a pullback vector bundle. Though, so you have a pullback metric here. OK? And let me call it pi star of omega. It's not a pi star in the sense of differential forms. <laughs> Okay, in, in the sense of pullback metric of vector bundle. Okay. Okay, and so by restriction, you get a metric here. Okay, and now you have a metric here. So you, you take this guy and you restrict to OX1 of minus 1. You call it, let's say, H. And that's an remission metric. Okay. 
on O x1 of minus 1. OK, and now you can compute the curvature with respect to this metric. You compute the curvature. So I take the, <coughs> the inverse metric, and which is the, induced me the dual metric, okay, induced on O of 1. Okay. And uh, this is the curvature. So this is a 1-1 one, one form, and a real closed 1-1 one, one form. As a such, you can consider it as a, uh, locally at least, as a, something which is a, an emission matrix. Okay. And if you want to discuss the positivity of this, uh, you have to discuss the positivity of this as a emission form on the tangent space of the manifold you are living on, that is x1. Okay. So what you do that is you take this form, is a 1-1 one, one form. And so you compute on v, v bar, for v inside dx1. OK? And then you, you ask if it is positive or not. OK? So the positivity of this metric in every direction of the tangent bundle corresponds to the positivity of the, I didn't define it, but the bisectional curvature of this metric on Tx. Okay, that's the, that's the usual correspondence. When you define ampleness for vector bundle, uh, you, 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 you go up to the projectivized bundle, and then you ask properties for positivity of that vector bundle on this line bundle. Right? That's a usual thing. And that, that, there's a, a same, the same correspondence uh, the level of positivity of curvature. Okay. But then, so this corresponds to positivity of t star x. Okay, that's a star coming up here. Because usually when you want to describe positivity of vector bundles, you take the projectivized of hyperplanes, right, to, to discuss the positivity. And then, and here I'm taking the projectivize of lines. So the positivity refers to the dual. Okay, it's, yeah. Okay, but then, so this is in the sense of bisectional curvature. And so the, the, the nice interpretation of the holomorphic sectional curvature, which is a little bit mysterious from the algebraic point of view, but at least here you can have a sort of interpretation. So holomorphic sectional curvature of omega negative corresponds to the positivity of this curvature but not tested on the whole tangent space of x1 but just on v1 okay in this bundle we selected for make this construction okay and as we have seen yesterday when i sketched very quickly the proof of this fundamental vanishing theorem, uh, which I told you was in the same spirit of Alfred Schwartz's lemma to prove the hyperbolicity of manifold with negative holomorphic sectional curvature, then you can reinterpret this in this sense. Okay, so reinterpretation. Of Alfred Schwartz's lemma. Say. So you have your, ma your map from C to X, OK? And now, as I told you yesterday, you can lift it up here, OK? And not only this is an entire map in X1, 
but it's, it, it has tautologically the further property that uh, f1, the derivative of f1, lands in v1. Okay, so that's another way of thinking about holomorphic sectional curvature. Okay, so when you want to pull back something to C and then test it on bigger and bigger disks and do this business of Alpha Schwarz of comparing Poincare metric and so on, okay, <coughs> what you're doing is that you are lifting this up here, okay, and what you're pulling back is the curvature of this guy, okay, but even if it's not positive everywhere, at least if you have holomorphic section or negative holomorphic section or curvature, this is positive along V1, and that's all you need because maps lifted here lens, the derivative lens in V1, and so you can pull back positivity from there. Okay, that, uh, that's an interpretation that I, I think it's nice, so I wanted to present this, okay? Okay, so this is the first thing I wanted to say. Yeah? supposed to be five minutes. So, so you mean the image is in v1? So you mean the derivative? No, no, no. No, no, no. The image is in x1. The derivative of f prime, so f, f1 is a map in x1, so the derivative a priori is a tangent vector to x1, but it's not everywhere, it, it's inside v1, okay? okay? Okay, so <clears throat> uh, now I wanted to, to make a, a computation in local coordinates because I think it's useful for everybody, including myself. So, okay, so <clears throat> take the case, the absolute case, once again, V equals to Tx, okay? So take a point X uh, zero, say, in X, and you fix local coordinate, centered at zero, at x zero, sorry, okay. So, <clears throat> okay, so now uh, you want to look at uh, x one, which is the projectivized of the tangent space, okay. And uh, so where uh, x is trivialized, everything is trivialized, and you want to put coordinate here. So the coordinate I'm putting here are Z1, Zn, and then C1, Cn minus 1. So these are affine coordinates on some affine uh, open set on the, on the fiber, okay? And so this point, so this point corresponds to point in X, right? And this, and this corresponds to some direction. And the direction I want this to correspond to is uh, this one, okay, I'm, I'm sitting in the affine part of the projectivized space where, uh, where the last direction is not zero, okay? So the, the point zero here correspond to x zero and the direction d over dz then, okay? Now, uh, take some curve from okay? So your f in coordinate will be given by f1 fn. Okay, and suppose that you are in the right uh, direction so that f prime n at zero is different from zero so that we land in this in this affine open set okay and now <coughs> now uh, what is f1 so f1 <coughs> uh, 
we defined it yesterday. You can look at, uh, it's the projective eye, so it's, you can look at uh, on x1 to be the pair f and the line given by f prime, right? So this is f1, fn. And then you have this direction. OK? And this is the same as this direction here. Right? Cool. So now these are the coordinates, the fn coordinates if we want it. So in coordinates, uh, f1 of t in these coordinates here is given by f1 of t, fn of t, and then f1 prime over f prime n, fn minus 1 prime over fn prime. OK? Good. Uh, now we take one more derivative. OK, so now we want to compute this first derivative. OK? So first, let me. Describe V1. So what's V1? Uh, so V1 is, um, as I said, it's spanned by the vertical direction and one horizontal direction, right? So a, a local holomorphic frame for this is given by V over dxc1, d over dxc n minus 1, right? These are the vertical directions. And then you have one more horizontal direction. And this direction is given by the point where you are. OK? And so that's this direction here. Okay. Let me call this eta. And this is Okay, of course, there is a, a, I mean, a small abuse of language, which is, uh, which is because of this choice of coordinates. And so here we are looking at this d over dz as tangent vector upstairs, not on x, OK? Because of this choice of coordinates here. OK, so this is v1. Now you compute f prime 1. So what you get is f prime 1 d over dz 1 f prime n dz n plus you have these derivatives here in the vertical directions. So <clears throat> this is plus let's say sum of over lambda from 1 to n minus 1 of f second lambda, f prime n minus f prime lambda, f second n over f prime n square d over dxc lambda. OK, that's the derivative. And now, uh, let me write it like this. So you can, you can take this f prime n here. And then this will become f prime n times eta, computed at the point uh, f, uh, f prime, let's say. Uh, you say, uh, so the point f1, fn. Um, sorry. Eta. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, you just substitute uh, for the c variables f prime, n, f prime over f prime n, which is the point where we are. Okay, we are here at this point. Plus something which is vertical. So you see your f prime 1 is exactly in the span you, you want it to, and so it, it actually lands in v1. Okay? And Okay, and so out of this, you can construct F2. And you use, you have, now you, have, you are on X2, so you have coordinates which are given by the Z coordinate, the Xi coordinate, and then you have another set of affine coordinates of the next projectivization, okay? And you take, for instance, you are, you're, you're supposed to be in the open set where this one does not vanish. The last one, okay? So in this coordinates, you can write it down. So F2 is just uh, F1, Fn. Then you still have F1 prime, Fn prime. And then here you have this F second lambda. where you have one more power here because you have to take affine coordinates. Okay? So why I want, do I want to, want to show you this? So you, you look that here is appearing this Vronskian type expression, right? F prime minus... Uh, and so yesterday we observed that this, project, this projectivized lifting of curves are uh, invariant under reparameterization, right? So the expression we find are expressions that are invariant under reparameterization, okay? So while I gave you, at least intuitively, the examples of sections of this green Griffith jet differential, uh, they're just weighted homogeneous polynomial in the derivatives, I didn't give any example of invariant jet differential with this supplementary invariant. They have to be weighted homogeneous polynomial but with supplementary invariant, okay? Invariants. And this is one of those polynomials, okay? So locally, such an expression, this is, a, uh, this is an algebraic differential equation in the derivative of f, and this expression is, is invariant under reparameterization by construction. Okay, you can go on and derive and derive and derive and find much more of this expression, which are more and more involved. Uh, but you can figure out a little bit what invariant jet differentials are. OK. So that's a computation I wanted to, made, to make. It's infinity. OK, and now I quit a little bit this kind of subject and I pass to the other one, the last one. So now the goal of the last part of the last talk is to give an idea of how to prove the following theorem. Okay? Okay, so we take S to be a, be a surface of general type I recall you that this means that the canonical bundle is big has lots of section okay and then we assume that you take the first chain class of s square that's a number 
you subtract c2 of s, which is a number 2, and you suppose that's positive. OK, that, well, that was is called the second segue number of the surface. OK. Then, ah, so I, I, I split the, state, the statement in four different statements. OK. So first one, the cotangent bundle of S is big. So meaning that you look at O S one of one, you projectivize T S lines in T S, you look at this guy here, and this is a line bundle on something which is one one dimensional more, it's three three dimensional, okay, and you require that this is B. So okay. So you, you have more positivity. Not just the canonical bundle, but the cotangent bundle itself is, is big. So this is equivalent by the projection formula, formula we saw yesterday. Uh, so the, the, the direct image shift of higher tensor power of this guy uh, um, yeah, are isomorphic of the, um, the glo to the um, holomorphic section of symmetric power of the cotangent bundle. So this means that high symmetric power of the cotangent bundle have lots of sections, OK? So two, there exists a surface over S. So this morphism is generically finite. So it's more or less finite. Then you have some positive dimensional fiber here and there. And you can suppose S to be tilde to be smooth. And F a foliation by curve, holomorphic foliation okay, by curve on S tilde, such that all entire curve from C to S, holomorphic, so non-constant, entire curve, lift to S tilde. OK, so you have F from C to S, you have S tilde here, and you have a lifting. And you have the property that the image of the lifting, so this is F tilde, is tangent to this foliation F. OK? So finally, I pronounced the, the word foliation in, <laughs> in my lecture. <laughs> so everybody's happy now. OK? <laughs> Three. S contains uh, at most a finite number of rational or elliptic curve. You have to say and elliptic curve. I don't know. I mean, both rational curves and elliptic curves are finite, if any. OK? And four, so this is Bogomolov. And four, every entire curve from C to S, holomorphic, non constant, so. S image contained in one of such curves. And this is McQuillan.
OK, so <coughs> you remember the statement of Green Griffith's conjecture? Uh, so for surfaces, uh, you're asking that there is a proper subvariety that is a curve, maybe reducible, containing the image of all entire curves. OK, and that's our proper subvariety. It's the union of those rational and elliptic curves, which are finite in number. So it's, they form a proper subvariety. And point four tells you that all entire curve must sit into these, these curves. OK? So before giving some element of proof, uh, let me discuss a little bit the statement and how you use hypothesis. So this hypothesis here is used only here. OK, so that's a numerical hypothesis you make on S in order to be sure that there are lots of symmetric, uh, dif symmetric uh, one form, OK, which correspond on having lots of section here, OK, when you take a big power. But so as we saw, since this guy is big, even you subtract some positivity, but if you take a large multiple, it will still have a section, OK? So this bigness here ensures that you will have some non-trivial one jet differential, so this E1M, OK, vanishing on some ample divisor, OK? So on X1, on S1, sorry, you will have this divisor which is given by the zero of this section. And by the fundamental theorem, vanishing theorem I discussed, uh, any entire curve, when you lift on S1, must sit into this divisor, must sit into this divisor, right? So your surface S tilde, it's more or less this divisor. OK. so. By using this, you can prove this, and by this, more or less, you have this. I, I will be more precise, okay? Just, just an informal discussion. And three and four, it's really something about uh, foliation, and I try to give some ideas, and then. Okay, so, idea of proof. OK, so this thing here, it's an Euler characteristic computation. OK? So <clears throat> basically, what you do, so for one, what you do is that you go upstairs, you take S1, which is projectivized of the tangent bundle of S. OK, here you have your O uh, S1 of 1. OK, uh, you take its churn class, call it U. And the cohomology algebra of uh, this guy here, S1z, it's isomorphic to the cohomology algebra, this is standard, it's isomorphic to, to the cohomology algebra of S over Z. When you extend with this new variable, U, and you have one polynomial equivalence relation. It's, it's more or less a definition of church classes. Okay? This is u square plus pi star c1 of s times u plus pi, one, pi star of c2 of s equal to 0. Okay? This description of this cohomology algebra, you can make computation, you can make intersection theory there. Okay? And so the first thing you do is that you compute the Euler characteristic of this guy. <laughs> Asymptotically in M, okay, by Hirzbruck, Riemann, Rock, for instance, okay, and leading coefficients. Coefficient is just the top self-intersection of this guy, okay. So the Euler characteristic of uh, O S one of M goes like M to the cube over three factorial, 
S1 is dimension 3, okay, times uh, u power 3 at lower order terms. Okay? And then <coughs> you compute this u cube using dividing by this polynomial using this relation. And up you find c1 squared minus c2. Okay? Very good. Now, once you compute this thing, you understand why you require this to be positive, okay? And if this is positive, the Euler characteristic grows as m cubed, okay? And now, <coughs> this is, um, so this is the alternating sum of cohomology groups. So if you raise h1, you're losing something, okay? So this is greater than, uh, sorry, it's um, smaller than h0 of n plus h2. Okay? And then you want to control this guy. Uh, and controlling this guy, you will infer that the growth of this guy is as m cubed, which is exactly the dimension of S1. So by the very first definition of bigness I gave, this means that OS1 of 1 is big. Okay? So you have to control this. Okay, I, I, I'm don't think, uh, I don't think I'm going to show you how to control H2. But anyway, it's not very hard. You, you have to just tell you briefly. So you go down on S, okay? So the first remark is that the, the cohomology of, uh, of OS1 of 1, it's the same as the cohomology of symmetric power of this guy at least for M, for M. That's basically for uh, Lerae spectral sequence, okay? Because, this, because O of one is relatively ample. So you have, a, you have a vanishing of higher direct images, and so you have the same cohomology. So controlling this cohomology is the same as controlling cohomology downstairs, okay? And then you have to make some cell duality argument and use the effectiveness of i power of k of ks, and you get the desired inequality. Okay, but I don't want to, it, it's, it's, it's not difficult. That's the simplest proof I know. There are other proofs using the fact that, for instance, if you take S to be a minimal surface of general type, which you can suppose, then the tangent bundle is semi-stable with respect to Ks, and then you have some semi-stability semi inequality, which gives the same result. It's even better, it's, you have a vanishing of this H2, indeed. And also, there are differential geometric proof using approximate Keller-Einstein metrics. And anyway, there are different proofs of this. OK. Okay, fair enough for point one. Now point two. As I was saying, uh, so now we discover that O S1 of one is big. This is from point one. Maybe you say by. Sorry. And <clears throat> so you know that a high power of this, even if you tensor with something 
with everything indeed, we'll, we'll still have a section. So being big is an open condition, okay? So if you perturb a little bit, and we'll just say big, so effective, Q effective, okay? So you take A, an ample line bundle of S, and then you see that uh, H0 of S1, O S1 of M, tensor pi upper star of a minus 1 is not 0 for m large enough. OK? So call sigma a non-zero section. <coughs> and call z the zero locus of this section. So yeah, we are here. S1. Okay, so <clears throat> this section, when you restrict to a fiber, the vibration, the projective vibration, is nothing more than a section of O, uh, o of M, right? So over a generic fiber, you have M points over S. But maybe this sigma could identic might identically vanish of some on some fiber. Okay, that's life. Okay, so if you restrict, so this is a surface. You can, if, if you want, you can take any reducible component or whatever. Okay, then you restrict pi to z, and you get a map from z to s, which is generically finite. Okay. OK, <clears throat> but now, if you have some map from C to S, uh, then you can lift up to S1. OK, this is F1. And the fundamental vanishing theorem tells you that this map factorizes through Z. Right? It must be contained in the zero locus of the differential vanishing of an ample divisor. Okay? This factorizes So at the end we have S, we have Z, we have F here, and you have F1. So you see every map from C to S, you can lift to this. So S tilde is not still Z. You have maybe to desingularize a little bit and take a modification. Okay, so at the end of the day, this S tilde is some desingularization of some bimeromorphic model of, of Z. Okay? But still, you have this thing like here. Okay? And now, where is the foliation coming from? So you have this Z inside S1, okay? So suppose, for instance, that Z is smooth, okay? I'll take a generic point of Z, okay? And, and uh, so you have these tangent space to Z. So of course, on S1, you always have your V1. OK? So this is rank 2, right? And then I'm going to intersect with V1, which is rank 2 also. OK? So at the generic point of Z, the tangent space of Z will be horizontal. OK? So it's horizontal. And you intersect with this guy. And this guy has one, dire one direction inside, which is vertical. OK? So when you intersect with something which is purely horizontal, uh, you get a one-dimensional intersection. OK? This is a generically uh, rank 1. OK? 
And so this is the tangent bundle of your foliation. OK? And now, of course, you can, then you can, that's on the risk open set, then you induce a foliation on the whole of set, then you can resolve singularities, and you have an induced foliation upstairs, and everything is fine. But remember by the computation that we made that so f goes, f1 goes to z, so the derivative of f1 uh, is in the tangent space of z. But by construction of the projectivized lifting, uh, tautologically, the derivative of f1 is also tangent to v. OK? And so f1 prime is in tf. Since it is both in Tz and V1 by, by construction. This is that F1 of C is tangent to this foliation. Okay. So <clears throat> you see one might hope to construct lots of these jet differentials and hope to cut. Uh, we, we, just, we just used one of them, and it's a surface. Maybe you can hope that you have another one, algebraically independent. There is another surface. You cut the two surfaces. You get a curve, right? Uh, so you get this curve, and every lifting must sit into this curve because it must sit in, bo in, in both of these surfaces. And this would give you the algebraic degeneracy of f, because now you project your, surface, your curve on, on s, and your, your starting f must, sits, must sits, uh, sit in this projection. Okay? But you don't know. I mean, the, 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 the base locus of this, of this bundle here may, might have a fixed component of, uh, of dimension 2. Okay, so. And so foliation come into the foliations, come into the picture. And, uh, so the, this, that's a combination of these two techniques, OK? And oh, oh no. Oh, no, OK, 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 48. <laughs> I thought it was noon. OK, okay so this is point two. So now we are in this situation. We have our f from c to s. You have this s tilde. You have your lifting. Let me call it f tilde here. Here you have a foliation. And remark that since this is a generically finite morphism to S, onto S, and S is of general type, then S tilde also is of general type. Okay? Because being of general type means that you have lots of pluricanonical uh, uh, forms here, and then you pull them back, and you have lots here too. OK? So of course, now we don't know anything about churn numbers of S tilde, but we don't care. OK? We, don't, we are not using them anymore, just for the first step. OK? OK, so we are in this situation here. And so this F 
as an entire leaf. Okay, so the, you have a leaf of this foliation uh, which has this tangency with this curve coming from C. Okay, that's an entire leaf. Okay. And so, <clears throat> let me tell you a spoiler, you, that. <laughs> so the, the theorem of McQuillan tells you that if you have a holomorphic foliation on a surface of general type, then an entire leaf cannot be the risky dense. Okay, that's, that's what he proves. Okay. And then it's not the risky dense upstairs, and it's not the risky dense downstairs. Okay. But to conclude, so even if we suppose that we are okay with point 0.4, okay, we, are still, we, we, we still have to say that the image is, is contained in this finite union of rational or elliptic curve. Okay, in principle, you might have lots of entire curves, each of them algebraically degenerate, not the risky dense, but sitting on infinitely many distinct uh, rational or elliptic curves, okay? So we still have to say that rational curves and elliptic curves are finite. Okay, so for this, uh, there is this theorem explained by Georges, which is a jean loup theorem, which helps us in to, to conclude here. Let me explain why. So of course, let me tell you this. Of course, if C inside S is rational or elliptic, then you can see them as an entire curve. Okay, you have map with dense image or subjective even. I mean, from C, from the complex plane to this curve. Okay, so. So even in the particular case where your f here is like algebraic or, I mean, it's, it's the image of an elliptic curve or a rational curve inside S, you can do the same trick. You can lift it up, okay? And you're going to find a, a leaf of this foliation which is rational or elliptic, okay? So, and, I, and so, Okay, but now you use you use John Lewis theorem and you deduce that either this foliation has a finite number of algebraic leaves. Or it, it has a, a meromorphic first integral, okay? So it, it is a, it's, it's a meromorphic vibration, okay? Or it is a vibration. Okay, so in both cases, you conclude. Why? So if we're in the first case, So you have a finite number of algebraic leaves. So once you have, every time you have an elliptic of a, or a rational curve in S, you can lift it up and it will become a, a leaf of this uh, foliation, an algebraic leaf of this foliation, but they are finite in number. So it means that there are finite in number here. Okay.
And second case, so now you have a vibration, okay? So by maybe resolving again, you can suppose it's a, it's a nice vibration, okay? And so you look at the fibers, and you want to exclude that this is a, ration, a, fibra a vibration by rational curve or elliptic curves, okay? If it's not a vibration by rational curve or elliptic curve, you may still have some rational or elliptic curve among the fibers, but they will be degenerate fibers, right? So they will be finite in number. So you just want to exclude that there are infinitely many, okay? This means that it's a vibration in rational curve or elliptic curve. But this is not possible because S is of general type. So surface of general type cannot have a vibration by rational curve or elliptic curve. Okay. You can check this by adjunction formula and Hodge index theorem, for instance. Okay. It's an exercise, maybe. As only. Okay, in the last two minutes, I give you McQuillan proof. <laughs> no. yeah. yeah. You're right. I'm right. Yeah. I mean, I mean you, 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 you mean that, uh, no, because I don't, you don't know that it's vertical. I mean, what, what do you mean? You say that uh, this, uh, you obtain an entire leaf. You started by an entire mm -hmm. leaf, right? In the second case, this leaf must be a fiber of the vibration. Mm -hmm. And this is impossible because the surface of general type cannot have uh, a vibration with the entire leaf. Because, uh, of course they can. You can have a finite number of uh, degenerating fiber which are rational. Ah, because it can be a, a piece of, ah. Yeah, just one, you can have a fiber of, g with general fiber of genus two, but with uh, some degenerate fiber of uh, genus uh, so zero. this leaf is not, an, it's not a complete fiber, it can be a piece of a fiber. It's reducible. Yeah. It's reducible. It can be reducible. Ah, okay, it yeah. can be a piece of it. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, Sorry. of course. So you, okay, so yeah, you, yeah, so you were not right. Eh? <laughs> yeah. no, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I have one minute. <laughs> so let me just tell you one thing, okay, and then I stop. So <clears throat> after all, even this case, I told you, it's a junction formula and an Hodge index theorem. So it's a business of intersection theory, OK? So the, the idea, the central idea of the last point to, to deal with entire curve is to try to, to, to develop an intersection theory with entire curves, OK? But that's a problem because entire curves are not compact. Okay, we are dealing with now the general case of transcendental images. Okay, so you have to, de to develop a, th a theory of of, uh, of intersection with this entire curve, and this is made by Alfors currents. So the key word is Alfors current. You can cook up a cohomology class uh, from starting from an entire curve, uh, which uh, behaves. Really, with, with this cohomology class, you can make intersection and behave really as your entire curve were compact. Okay? And then, <clears throat> once you have this cohomology class, 
call it phi. There are two crucial things that you have to control, which are the, respectively the intersection of this guy <coughs> with, the, with the canonical bundle of defoliation, and the intersection of this guy with the conormal bundle of defoliation. Okay, you have to control these two. That's, that's hard, okay? Because the definition of this cohomology class is a limit, uh, is a weak limit of things, of integration over these bigger and bigger disks. And you really have to, to, to be careful and to control how it intersects these two stuff. Uh, especially when the foliation is singular, as usual. We have seen in the general philosophy in Enrica talk. I mean, the intersection theory with object linked to defoliation uh, um, localized around singular points, right? So you really have to, when defoliation is smooth, this intersection is trivial to compute. It's very easy. But in general, it's, it's hard, okay? But nevertheless, you can, you can um, compute this and you get this inequality here and this inequality here. You can show this. And once you have this, these two guys are linked to the canonical bundle of your surface, okay? And you get a contradiction in this way. So you, you intersect the same current with the canonical bundle, and you have from one side that it has to be uh, non-positive by this, and on the other hand, you show that it must be positive if the surface is of general type, okay? So of course I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, but that's the general idea. It's intersection theory with currents. Okay, I think it's really everything I <laughs> wanted to say. Thank you very much.